together. Since it's all four of us, and say good morning, good morning from the Church on the Park. We're glad you're all here today. Uh, Rich and Ellen and Linda are, she had to be here, but Rich and Ellen graciously have made it all the way over from the river there in this uh, snow and slush, and we're delighted that you are here uh, at home, and we will nevertheless join together and worship the Lord. However, we have good news and bad news. The bad news is Jared is not feeling well, and so we gave him the day off, better to be safe than sorry, so there is no music. Oh, come on up, come on up. Come on up. Wow, we've increased our numbers by 50%. Wave high, wave high. I know, plenty of parking. We were just saying the bad news is Jared's not feeling well, so not here. But the good news is that leaves extra time for me to keep preaching. So I'll have a really long sermon today. Woo! Not till three. We got a lot of time. So let's all join together and worship the Lord, and folks can take their seats. And Linda is going to whip out her kazoo and play a little introit for us. Not really. Hey, before uh, I forget, because I forget every week, Carolyn O'Connor wants everybody to know that she is here on the stream with you, though she doesn't have a Gmail account and can't sign into the uh, chat thing that's going on. She is here faithfully every single Sunday. Yay, Carolyn! Yay! Awesome. Uh, I do want to be uh, praying and make you aware of a couple of things today before we start. Um, one is that we are going to just keep continuing doing worship the way we're doing it. And if we get six people here, in some ways, that's perfect number. We, we want to really uh, honor the situation in the county and in the state and the country with infection rates. So just want to encourage everybody. It's great that you're tuning in through the live stream, uh, and it's perfectly appropriate to not be here for church. We're just going to keep, keep on keeping on, and at some point, uh, things will start to get better, and there'll be more people back in our pews uh, to, to join in each other in fellowship. Because I know, however wonderful the sermons are, what you're really wanting and missing right now is fellowship with one another and just seeing one another. And that is as it should be and the highest compliment to a pastor. Maybe not a preacher, but to a pastor. So let's join together in the call to worship. Is your soul barren and swallowed by thirst? Is your soul faint and devoured by hunger? The feast of God spreads from a few loaves and fishes. Is your soul weary and dreaming of sleep? The voice of God bids renewal and hope. Is your soul homeless and sheltered by fear? The hand of God builds a home on the rock. Let us lift up our hands, let our lips praise God's name, for steadfast love is better than life, and heaven's power is greater than death. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks this day that you would make us mighty in such humility. We give thanks for each person who has traveled here via the internet or via their own feet and vehicle to be in the presence of each other and to be in the presence that you have placed in front of us your peace, your love, your hope, and your accountability. We ask this day that you might fill us with a sense of calm and of purpose and of hope. Bless this time together here in this sanctuary and at home in our living rooms and kitchens. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I would invite those that are here to stand with me as we do the hard work of the faith. Let us pray. We are grateful, O oh God, that you walk with us all the days of our lives. We are thankful that you formed our inward parts, knit us in our mother's womb, and call us by name. You have enough concern about the individuals of your creation to give each one your attention. 
You call repeatedly until we realize it is you summoning us. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Please be remain standing <laughs> for the profession of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I can sing it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please be seated. The scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 139. It's a very long and rich Psalm. So I've picked a few verses from that. Hear the word of the Lord. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. Here ends the reading of the word. I've been trying really hard this past year to get something straight in my head, but I just can't seem to get a handle on it. Sometimes, every once in a while, and at my own prompting, I take it down off the shelf, I open up the box, and I hold it in my hands, and I turn it over in my mind, but then, inevitably, I return it to the box, and back on the shelf it goes. Other times, every now and then, that same box gets knocked off the shelf and falls to the floor with a crash, spilling out all over the room with pieces lying strewn everywhere. I start picking them up and sorting them into piles. But like a jigsaw puzzle that comes without corners, it seems I can't find the place to begin to fit them all together. I get frustrated, perhaps too easily, but nevertheless I, I gather everything up together again and I place them carefully in the box and then I place it back on its spot on the shelf. It is somewhat pleasantly poignant then, particularly 
given recent events, that it would be a Republican president who prompts me today to pull that box down off the shelf and really dig deeply into it. 37 years ago in 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed into law that the third Monday in January would be forever designated as a national holiday to honor the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Of course, this was no easy ta task and did not happen overnight. It took 15 years after Reverend King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. And it took even longer, another 17 years, not until 2000, before all 50 states would come to observe the holiday. A timeline such as this, however, kind of tells the tale. Nevertheless, it would seem, as evidenced in our nation these past four years, and especially on January 6th of this year, it is very much a tale that is still being written. Really, though, it seems to be the same old story when it comes to the issue of race in America. I know that I, and I'm probably not alone here, in my naivety had really believed we were at least beginning to get past some of all of that when in 2012 our nation elected its first African-American president. Almost immediately, though, the pendulum swung back the other way and with a vengeance. Any doubts we had about how deeply rooted racism is in this country were finally and fully put to rest when we saw the photograph of that Yahoo strolling through the halls of the United States Capitol building carrying the Confederate flag. Such a gut punch. The truth is, racism is very much alive and well, and even on the rise in our nation. Recently, the Center for Strategic and International Studies reported that since 1994, right-wing attacks and plots have accounted for the majority of all terrorist incidents in the United States. And that total number, of that total number, uh, has grown significantly in the past six years. Right-wing extremists per perpetrated two-thirds of the attacks and plots in the U.S. last year, uh, two years ago, 2019, and over 90% of them this past year in 2020. For much of the past 20 years, much of our nation's attention has been focused on foreign enemies, while the fact is these domestic enemies are by far the biggest threat to our society. It is past time we, as a nation, admit the truth of cartoonist Walt Kelly's Pogo. We have met the enemy, and they are us. My question today, though, and what I've been keeping in that box, stored up on that shelf in my brain, is what truth should we, as a church, be admitting about race in our country, to ourselves first and foremost? How do we, as an overwhelmingly white congregation, begin to approach the matter of race? Do we have anything to say on the subject? If so, what should we say? And to whom should we be saying it? Is there a right thing to say or a right way to say it? It's usually at this point I put the box back on the shelf. I confess I simply don't have the answers to many of these questions, not as a straight white male, and unfortunately, not as your pastor. I further confess that every time I consider these questions, I'm quite convinced that any answer I give will be perceived by some as inappropriate, unappreciated, or flat out wrong. Is there such a thing as white privilege? I can't imagine how there can't be. There's only so much pie. So if one slice of opportunity, advantage, education, or resources is smaller, other slices will be necessarily larger. 
Being a rather big guy, I'm absolutely aware that people regard me warily when I pass by them on the sidewalk, making all kinds of assumptions about who and what I might be. I have no doubt that people of color who walk around Lily White Canton, New York, have had their own uncomfortable and unwarranted experiences. Having witnessed firsthand that a long-haired dude in a VW bus with Grateful Dead stickers on the back is much more likely to get pulled over, it is no stretch for me to imagine that skin color, attire, and home address increase that probability many times over and that there is a marked disparity in who gets treated how once at the curb. Much worse are the systems actively at work, educational, economic, societal, civil, and cultural, which seek to both create and reinforce these divisions and disparities, allowing the generational spread of bias and bigotry and injustice. I may not be able to understand all of that, but I understand enough of it to conclude not only that we have a problem in this country, but that our country is itself problematic at its root and has been throughout its history. Being honest with ourselves about ourselves is among the most patriotic things we can do. I do not doubt for a moment that each of you understands all of this at a profound level. The question remains, however, what are we going to do about it as church folk who are white? For me, this is where things get tricky. None of us should have any doubt that the civil rights movement with its protests, speeches, and nonviolent actions carried the day and hit the mark in changing the narrative and our nation. Though modest by any comparison, white church folk certainly played a role in helping to reach a critical mass of conscience in our nation. However, the victory was nowhere near as resounding as we had hoped or assumed. Moreover, the battlefield has now changed and given us reason to reconsider those tactics of the cause. Whereas the power of one's vote remains the most effective tool to enact change through legislation, law, and policy, the past 50 years have shown us that the real change that needs to occur is a change in the hearts of the people of this nation. Of course, this is the truth of which Dr. Martin Luther King was fully aware, and one which served as the blueprint for the civil rights movement. As a nation and as a church, this is the legacy we've inherited from Dr. King, and we celebrate this each year on this weekend in every state in the nation. In last week's sermon, the case was made for understanding the Declaration of Independence first and foremost as a theological document. In this week's sermon, the case is being made that the civil rights movement was, and more importantly is still, first and foremost a theological movement. One in which the church in general, and to which our congregation in particular and especially, is uniquely suited. Whereas last week, through scripture passages found in Genesis and the Gospel of Mark, we examined the foundational belief in God as creator of the world, this week we turn to the 139th Psalm to establish our formative belief in God as creator of each and every person of every race. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. 
I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The words of the psalmist seem to celebrate not just one among many in the complex web of relationships which constitute our lives, but a connection to God which is first among many, a relationship which is at once primordial, mystical, and complete. A connection which begins in the womb and runs throughout all of our days and all of our experiences, connecting us both to the Creator and to every other creature in the realm. It doesn't help us work out our humanity. It is the relationship which is our humanity. Now, born of this depth of intimacy, such a connection, such a relationship, in turn, not only strives to create, but is compelled to create a community which is transacted not just politically, socially, economically, but more importantly, through the virtues of hope, justice, love, and in particular, accountability, the corner pieces of the puzzle. Such a community doesn't just dream of a world where little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. It labors, as Dr. King did, to make it happen. Such a community lifts up every valley, makes low each hill and mountain, makes the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight to reveal the glory of the Lord and the glory of the connection between creature and creator. Such a community over time brings about monumental change through the small and mostly unnoticed acts of love and sacrifice it offers to the world. This church is such a community. In these walls, and among her faithful is the connection that people are seeking in their lives. A connection which begins first with God, the one who formed our inward parts, reaches across pews and through the live stream to other people, our brothers and our sisters who are on the march with us, extends out to the larger world in such need of healing and grace, and ends finally with a connection back to ourselves such that we can truly begin to understand and come to believe that we are, each of us, fearfully and wondrously made. How weighty is such a thought, O oh God? Unfortunately, too many people, politicians, and yes, even churches, forget that beyond the nine rings of hell, articulated by Dante in his Inferno, limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, anger, heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery, is the tenth ring saved for the disloyal. In this place abides not only those few who have actively betrayed the trust placed in them, but also the great many more who simply failed through sins of commission or omission, to defend and support those to whom God has connected them and the community to which God has called them. At this point in our history, the stakes have never been higher for our nation if we truly wish to make real the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King, especially for the church as Lily White as we may be. Because if real connection and authentic community doesn't happen in a church, it won't happen anywhere. If real connection and authentic community take root in a church, it eventually begins to flourish and to spread and to grow and to quite literally change the world. We become the place where tears are wiped away where souls cry out with joyful shouts, where tables are spread and mouths are fed, where spirits sing of wondrous things, 
And God is at work in us to do the great tasks which are now required of us. Because the promise to which we are bound is that through us, through our connection to God, which arises first in the womb, and the connection we create to our community through acts of love and accountability, God will most surely fulfill the dream of Dr. King and the dream of our nation that all of us, each and every child of God, has been created equal. This is the only way all the pieces, each fearfully and wondrously made, will ever fit together. And the people were heard say, Amen. Amen. So we've moved on to the ritual of friendship. I still don't know how to know how many people are on this watching this. It, yeah, concurrent viewers, 24. So that's 24 people. But then it says playbacks, 43. And that leads me to believe that there are either 43 minus 24 more people watching or 43 plus 24 people watching. <laughs> Get out your slide roll, Rich. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, the, it's delightful that, you know, even if we have 24, I know that, you know, some of the viewers have more than one person, you know, we're, uh, we're maintaining a vital worship here and really appreciate the effort uh, that people are making to be here today. So going through this, uh, Tom Dildine is here, and Andy Leffler is back again, uh, George is here, Barry Walsh, and Ellen and Dave McMaster. Well, actually, it just says Ellen. I'm not sure if Dave's watching. We probably, sh probably shouldn't give him credit if credit is not due. Uh, Jim and Lynn send greetings. Uh, Susan Aikens is on. She says, I am tired of shoveling. Yeah, hang on to that thought. Uh, Rob and Carolyn and Emmy and Kate say that t today's snow brings August tomatoes. <laughs> so she's, they say good morning on this snow globe morning. Uh, Barry says a good thing about remote services. We don't have to decide if we should cancel due to weather. No angst. That's what we're going to put on the, the board next week outside. No angst. No angst. Uh, Krista says good morning. Bill Parker, good morning to all. Go Bills, yes. <laughs> Buffalo Bills, that is. Um, let's see. So some uh, Georgia Vos, Janet Stitt. Janet Stitt should get extra kudos today because she went to the... Uh, Presbytery meeting yesterday virtually. I think that was the first time we had an elder representative in quite some time. So thank you for Janet and also for volunteering to be our new clerk of session. Um, Ellen would like prayers for Seth and his family on the death of his wife Marlene, married 64 years. Prayers and prayers for Don Butters. She's asking. He's having an arterial transplant. Uh, Barb Brown, good morning, everyone. And <laughs> Barb Brown says, yes, Carolyn. Janice Reynolds is here. Hello to her. Melba Ranke. Janet Stitt for uh, ask prayers for neighbor and friend Fran Buckley. Who is 101 years old and recovering from surgery. 
That's, that's something else. Patience says, good morning. Please pray for the caregivers at United Helpers. These deaths are getting harder and harder for us all. We are all exhausted. Second vaccine on Thursday. I believe the, the count now stands at 15 people who have died at the Canton United Helpers. Josh Holbrook, look at you, woo, Josh. And uh, let's see, Jane Cable is here. Uh, David wants to make sure he gets credit for being here, Ellen says. Uh, so that's good. Anything else you care to be sharing? Mrs. Potter. Prayers for Tucker recovering from Lyme disease. He is recovering slowly. And uh, I am so uh, determined to get these kids back to college that I self-isolated last week out at the lake. It was really hard. I got myself tested yesterday, and I'll be going back to the lake for more hardship and uh, hopefully get my results Monday or Tuesday and, and reintegrate into my family, into the society at large. But again, trying to be safe, but sorry. I know that you have SLU students back, right, Kristen? That's going well. And uh, Drew, you're back to, to school, right? I mean, you're, but you're taking classes. You're not back physically at school. Right. Do, are you going to every class? I'm going to every class, he said. <laughs> hey, you know what? Good for you. This is where the wheel hits the road, so right on. Uh, also, just want to let you know that I, I did hear again from Carrie Whalen. She really uh, did some damage in her hand. She's got broken fingers and a wrist and a thumb, and it's just, boy, it's just terrible. Thankfully, her uh, grown kids have been taking shifts to be with her last week and this coming week, so that's uh, great, and we continue to pray for her. Tom has uh, another uh, procedure scheduled this next week, Tuesday, I believe, at this point, an ablation to the heart which uh, actually kills some of the, the, the cells that cause the heart to misfire uh, or to fire incorrectly, uh, out of order. So he's having that done, and hopefully on top of the transplant or the um, pacemaker implanted he had, this should help the cause. Um, and we pray for Beth Hayes on the death of her brother, Don. Uh, they had the funeral this past weekend. Karen Parker, I hear, is doing, doing pretty well. And so um, we continue to pray for her, and Dick Stone is recovering well from COVID. No um, um, symptoms at this point. I did talk to Bob Fraser, and he just sounds great, and so I'm delighted that his surgery uh, on his valve and his heart uh, went well, and he seems to really be um, improving. And so prayers for lots of folks here, and let us uh, gather ourselves and Offer up these prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, this day we give you thanks for this technology and this determination evident in this morning's service. We thank you for so many who have tuned in from far and wide. We thank you for their loyalty. We thank you that Carol O'Connor has been here each and every Sunday. We acknowledge her and her important presence in our church and in our lives. We ask healing for Jarrett Larson, our director of music and very talented pianist as he is not feeling well we pray that it's just a, a bug and not the bug we pray for Tom Dildine uh, having another uh, cardiac procedure this week we pray for Carrie Whalen recovering from fractured wrist and fingers pray comfort for Beth Hayes on the death of her brother Don we pray for Karen Parker strengthening herself Prayers of recovery for Dick Stone, for all those who are ailing with a uh, COVID. We ask that you continue to make well Bob Fraser and Bill Rohde, who took a fall. We pray for Bill Webb and Marty Lyon. We pray for Shelley and Chad for our villa, for Nicholas. We pray for patients and all the staff and workers and residents at the nursing home here in Canton in this incredibly dark and difficult time. We pray uh, for Nancy, for Krista, still recovering from knee replacement surgery. Pray for Pastor Donna, Jose, for Andrew, for all those who are in hospitals or nursing homes or in their home. We pray for those serving our nation and their families. We pray for those infected and affected by COVID. 
We pray for the Oxbow Presbyterian Church. We pray for this presbytery. We pray for our nation, that things may go smoothly from here on out, beginning with this week. We pray for Seth and his family on the death of his wife, Marlene. We pray for Fran, recovering from surgery. We pray for Tucker, uh, being treated for Lyme disease. And we ask this day, O oh God, that this church right here, right now, may help lead in the healing of division, that we may come to be people who overcome the problems of race in this nation, but particularly those that may be here in this town and surely are. And we pray that each of us might be humbled to know that we have been fearfully and wondrously made by you. And we ask that as your creature, as your son or daughter, that we may bear witness to this truth and to your love throughout all the ends of this earth. And we ask these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, I failed to mention that there are quite a few birthdays happening this week. And Galen says the YouTube channel is apparently not functioning. Well, we know that's not the case. Um, birthdays. Elliot Rohde. And Matt Gale on today, so happy birthday to them. Our villa has a birthday Tuesday. Uh, Tom Potter Jr. Wednesday. And Bill Gollinger on Friday. What is he, like 40 by now? I don't know. And Laura Gibson, among others. So we pray for all those folks. Any opportunity for celebration is a good opportunity. And so we pray for the students who are back also in the community here and those that are studying at home, uh, and particularly for their parents. So, a lot of blanks to fill in with Jared not here, aren't there? <laughs> so that would leave us <laughs> to the benediction. Go from this place in peace and hope, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.